George asked me to do the presentation on therapeutic relationship factors, I had a slightly different reaction than the previous John did, which is, you really need a different John. Um, and that, if you don't know, is John Norcross. Uh, if you don't have this book, I'm going to be basing a number, most of my comments on his recent book with uh, Oxford University Press, Psychotherapy Relationships That Work. If you have the first edition, you need the second edition. Uh, it's a wonderful resource, and while you're there, um, you can pick up uh, Louis and uh, uh, his uh, therapeutic principle. There are principles of therapeutic change that work, and since you're buying, you can buy my uh, assessments <laughs> that work, you can buy Peter Nathan's treatments that work. I mean, it's, it's Christmas, right? <laughs> so, I'm going to try to channel uh, John Norcross. I'm shorter and lighter than John, uh, but uh, I know everyone else, so I'll do my best. Um, one of the things that uh, John strongly recommends when he presents his work, which is what I'm trying to do, is that based on the task force that they put together to review all the different aspects of the therapeutic relationship, there are a number of elements that have pretty strong empirical support. In fact, so many that you couldn't possibly pay attention to all of them in your work. And so what I'm going to do is try to uh, give you some practical suggestions following on what John says, which is pick three or four that make the most sense to you of the ones that have been shown to work. And by work, he means there's <coughs> enough research, enough studies with enough participants across a broad range of uh, situations that we can be pretty sure that these uh, aspects of the relationship are important and make a difference. These include alliance in individual, adult, in child and family, and in couples therapy. It includes, I'm not a group person, so I'm sorry, George, correct me, but sort of the same kind of thing in group, cohesion. Um, empathy we'll hear about in another presentation, and then I'll talk a little bit as well about treatment monitoring issues. And you've heard some of that kind of information already this morning, and I just want to give you some numbers to show uh, the strength of that. So, let me start with the therapeutic alliance. Everyone knows what it is, right? So, I just want to make clear that this is what I'm talking about, the most commonly used definition out there. And it's important, at least for my purposes, that we look at these three elements, agreement on the tasks of therapy, the goals of therapy, and the bond, because there are things here that you can deal with very explicitly with your client, if it fits with the work that you're doing. And so when you see in a moment that a good alliance makes a difference, a lot of this is under your control. Working very clearly on the tasks and goals of, their, of therapy, getting agreement, checking in frequently when necessary, you can control that. And it helps to be a nice person. But. So, the most evidence there is, is for individual adult treatment. And I'll assume everyone knows about meta-analysis, a quantitative uh, summary of the literature. There are many, many, many studies that have shown it makes a difference. A good alliance, um, correlation of 0.28 between alliance ratings and outcome. Now there's some differences, nothing major in terms of who rates the alliance your clients, the therapists, outside observers, whether it's the third session, the fourth session, the sixth session, what the outcome measure is. But if you kind of, you know, close your eyes or squint, which is what meta-analysis does, looking at everything, that's what you come up with. Okay? Um, it makes a big difference. Now, we can't say causally because uh, it'd be kind of hard to get a study through ethics on comparing uh, a good therapeutic alliance with an intentional bad therapeutic alliance. Um, I'm sure we won't be doing that in our PPR. But um, that's what we get from correlation studies. No difference. No difference between type of treatment, type orientation therapy. Uh, 
um, it was, there are no differences. But nothing statistically different. The alliance is important everywhere. If I move now to child and adolescent treatments, there's far fewer studies, but it looks like a similar kind of effect. Okay? Correlation 0.11. Alliance makes a difference. For those of you who work with this population, there is one thing I would point out, though, and that is there is some research suggesting that although it's important to have a good alliance with the youth or child and a good alliance with the parents, they have different effects. Having a good alliance with the child or youth is correlated with outcome. Having a good alliance with the parent is correlated with having your client come to therapy and complete therapy. Okay? Both pretty important. You see the same thing when you look at couple and broadly defined family therapy. Alliance, very important, far fewer studies and more complications of trying to measure things with more people. Uh, but again, the message comes across time and time and time again. Alliance is important, it's something that's not fully but largely under your control to address at the beginning and throughout treatment. Related to that, is that, I'm sure for no one in this room, but I'm sure everyone has heard that sometimes other therapists have problems with the therapeutic alliance. Okay? Something occasionally goes wrong, or more than occasionally. These so-called therapeutic ruptures occur rather frequently, even with pretty good therapists. And what's very clear is that addressing them is critical to good therapy, or good outcome in therapy. If you look at the correlational studies, recognizing when these ruptures occur, when you've said something prematurely to the client, or you've misunderstood, or something has happened where there has been a break in the communication, recognizing them and doing something about them is correlated 0.52 with outcome. Pretty strong. When you look at actual studies where people have been trained in their therapy uh, activities to specifically recognize and deal with these issues, so what doing something above and beyond what they would normally do, the effect size is still okay, 0.11, which is a standard deviation of about uh, 0.1. But um, clearly the picture together is that being aware of when ruptures occur, when problems occur, and doing something about them, it's critical. Which very nicely moves me into the final part I want to talk about, and that's treatment monitoring. You heard this morning that a number of researchers have found that we're not particularly good at being able to identify who's likely to deteriorate or have a failure in care. There's also research that's been done suggesting we're also not very good at predicting who's going to do really well. Um, some work I've done in our clinic, when we ask clients, did you get what you wanted? Are you satisfied? Did the outcome what you wanted? And then you look at session notes and final reports in the clinical file. If I can generalize beyond our clinic to the rest of the world, our therapist missed half of the satisfied clients that yeah, we thought it was okay, but we didn't realize just how satisfied the clients were. And it may be because you know, clients sometimes have more modest expectations for treatment than we do as therapists. However you want to put it together, it seems pretty clear that like most people and most professionals, we could benefit from regular, accurate feedback. That's all I'm suggesting, and that's what treatment monitoring is about. That is collecting on a regular basis some indication of how the client is doing. Coming back to uh, John's book, um, Mike Lambert has a chapter in there talking about both his outcome questionnaire, which many of you know, and some other uh, outcome management um, measures that are available. By and large, to put these into numbers that you can perhaps uh, deal with more easily than effect sizes, 
it's a really good thing to use outcome monitoring. Because compared to not doing it, when you do it, the clients, the clients are 2.6 times more likely to improve if you look at the OQ. <coughs> if you look at the, the partners for change outcome management system, 3.5 times more likely. Using this regular feedback helps you to enhance the effects of your treatment, something that we all want to do. And it greatly reduces the likelihood of deterioration. It's a huge impact. I just want to share with you, how many of you know of the research on the OQ? Can I just quickly say? Okay, for those, the rest of you who don't know this, I'm just going to describe a couple of uh, Lambert studies, and it's the same kind of procedure. They've been done with thousands and thousands and thousands of clients now. Uh, this is from an earlier meta-analysis. Randomly assign conditions. Every client, every session fills out the OQ. But in half the cases, that's all that happens. It goes in the file, the research file. <laughs> in the other half um, of these studies, the clinician gets feedback. But they purposely made the feedback so minimal to see if it had any effect. So all that happened is when you picked up your case file to see your client, there was a sticker on the outside. A red sticker, a yellow sticker, or a green sticker. And all it means is based on how your client filled out the last OQ, how is he or she doing compared to the norms that have been established? A green sticker means good stuff. Keep doing whatever it is you're doing. We don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. A yellow sticker is yeah, the improvement isn't quite at the rate we think it should be. Check what you're doing. A red sticker is there really is a problem. Things are not working out. And in some of the other studies, they did something a little bit more elaborate. But in many of the studies, initial studies, that's all they did. But simply saying to you as a clinician, what's happening is fine, or think about it a bit. Just with that minimal feedback, not with even looking at the data that they filled out, what symptoms they have, what are they concerned about, huge changes occurred compared to not getting feedback. If you compare to no feedback, you get 35% of people improving as compared to 21. And you get a huge, you can make yourself, a huge reduction in the number for golf course. So imagine what would happen if this this was like real clinical practice, where you actually got feedback from the OQ. The numbers would be even stronger, presumably. So with fairly simple measures, they take about five minutes, it can have a huge impact on your treatment. And let me just emphasize, this cut across all orientations, disciplines, and a huge range of uh, disorders, diagnoses. All of the things that I've talked about today, if you want to think about practically, I'm just going to follow from what uh, Amy said this morning about research and community in your practice. These kinds of things can easily be included in your practice. A few minutes prior to each session to fill that out. Third or fourth session, a very brief uh, working alliance inventory uh, in the clinical supervision I've done for about 15 years. Actually, clients at the end of every session fill out a brief measure. How, how was the session for you? How connected did you feel to the therapist? Were there any problems? And if anything comes up, the next session, they raise it with the patient. So all of these things can be included easily in most clinical settings. Having said that, I certainly don't want to give you the sense that all the answers we require are here. This is just a big picture, and hopefully we'll get you thinking about what this might want you 